Hey, welcome back to Countering the Kalam. In this part, I'm going to start refuting any supposed scientific evidence that's presented along with the Kalam cosmological argument. But before I start doing that, there's something very important I want to get up front about the basic facts of modern cosmology that just need to be stated. The most honest answer about the origin of the universe is quite simply, we do not yet know. This is very quickly followed up with, it is quite possible that we may never know. This very basic fact is actually acknowledged by apologist William Lane Craig in his book, Creation Out of Nothing, on page 246. And I quote, It is true that an accurate physical description of the universe prior to the Planck time remains unknown and perhaps always will remain unknown, thereby affording room for speculations aimed at averting the origin of time and space implied in the expanding universe. So what does this mean? This means everything that goes on, both science and theology-wise, that talks about the beginning of the universe is speculative. Science, at least, is kind of chipping away at the possibilities. It's finding things that we can say definitely didn't happen. Ultimately, this is why the Kalam and any other cosmological argument is an argument from ignorance. An argument from ignorance is basically, I don't know, therefore God. The Kalam just dresses this fundamental problem up a bit, and it just leaves the core issue there and tries to hide it as best it can. All right. All that out of the way, let's get into the science. All right, here's the first piece of science that Dr. Craig's going to try and use to support his premise that the universe began to exist. It's known as the Big Bang Singularity Theorem. And the first thing you got to realize here is that a singularity is different from the regular old Big Bang Theory. The Big Bang Theory actually says nothing about how the universe came into existence and only describes how our space-time universe expanded and evolved after what's known as the first Planck second. Just in case you were wondering, a Planck second is a second times 10 to the negative 43rd power. Anyway, the Big Bang Singularity is an attempt to explain what happened before that first Planck second. And it's done assuming that general relativity still holds at the scales involved at that point. What we get is a mathematical and physical singularity where many physical properties pretty much quickly break down into infinity. This includes infinite temperature, density, and curvature. So now that we've defined the singularity theory, how do we show that it doesn't support the clock? Well, the first thing you got to know is that the singularity is largely disregarded by modern cosmologists. This is because that critical assumption that's made, that general relativity holds before the first Planck second, is known to be unsound. Once you get to that point in the Big Bang, at that small scale, quantum mechanical effects become extremely important and general relativity breaks down. In fact, singularities are generally a sign that there's a missing piece to a scientific theory We've already got examples of this before in physics. Now, as it turns out, cosmologists already know that there's a missing piece to general relativity. Specifically, we don't have an understanding of quantum gravity yet, and that's required to marry quantum mechanics to general relativity. This is the biggest problem that faces modern physics today. That all said, our best attempts to account for quantum mechanical effects point to the idea that there was no actual singularity at the beginning of our space-time universe. So, if all that's not enough to convince you that the Big Bang singularity isn't even a valid theory, let alone evidence for the, to support the Kalam cosmological argument, there's another point that needs to be made. Even if the singularity theory were held as valid, it doesn't imply that all matter and energy simply came into existence by divine fiat. Remember the philosophy section. Dr. Craig has got to show that all of physical reality had an absolute beginning and was preceded by nothing. What says the universe didn't exist perpetually in this state of infinite density, temperature, and curvature before it started expanding via natural processes? So, in order to correct this theologically untenable situation, some sleight of hand is going to be required. Now, if you remember back to the philosophy section, you're going to know that Dr. Craig really doesn't like the idea of actual infinites. 
So normally you'd assume that a person with a strong commitment against the existence of anything that's a completed infinite would mean such a person would reject the Big Bang Singularity Theory with all of its infinite properties. Never one to disappoint, Dr. Craig directly tries to argue that the singularity being infinite actually means it's equivalent to literally nothing. Quote Dr. Craig, This event that marked the beginning of the universe becomes all the more amazing when one reflects on the fact that the state of infinite density is synonymous to nothing. There can be no object that possesses infinite density, for if it had any size at all, it could still be more dense. So, rather than agree with the scientists who show that general relativity doesn't hold at these extremely small scales and reject the Bing Bang Singularity Theorem, apologists must now defy any notion of mathematics and state that infinity equals zero. This is just plain bad philosophy, as pointed out by philosopher Wes Morrison. I quote, no one would suppose that it follows from the fact that there could be no round squares, that round square is synonymous with nothing. But neither should anyone suppose it follows from the fact, assuming that it is a fact, that there could be no infinitely dense objects, that infinite density is synonymous with nothing. Still, the problem seems to get worse the more you think about it. Because if on some reflection it almost seems like the apologists have to deny the transitive property of equality. You know, that if A equals B, B, then B equals A. Because if an apologist holds that no actual infinite can exist, and also states that something with infinite density is synonymous with nothing, then they cannot claim that we had creation out of nothing. This is because if there was actually a state of nothing, then by the apologist's own definition, that's the same thing as an actual infinite existing. The whole thing is just silly on its face. So now that I've shown that the singularity theory doesn't support the fact that our universe had an absolute beginning preceded by nothing, let's look at the second piece of evidence that Dr. Craig cites to support premise two of the Kalam. This is a paper written in 2003 by scientists Arvin Bord, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin. Basically what the theory says is that any space-time universe that is expanding cannot always have been expanding. And one of the things that we know is that our universe is expanding, kind of like an inflating balloon. So this is actually a pretty important piece of information because one of the scientific assumptions for the 20th century was that our universe kind of always existed in whatever fashion that it does now. So what also makes this theory so very powerful is that it only requires a very basic assumption that the space-time in question is expanding. That's it. This means it applies to a wide variety of cosmological models, most importantly, any cosmological model that you're going to apply to our actual universe. So we know it's a very important theory, and it's a very powerful theory, but what we also need to know is that it doesn't support the Kalam cosmological argument. The most important thing that you have to realize from the board guth lenkin theorem is that all that it states about a universe that's in inflation is that that space-time universe cannot have been expanding infinitely into the past. That's it. This isn't a little of the theory, because it's pretty extraordinary and has had fairly significant impacts on modern cosmology. The problem is, apologists like William Lane Craig try to make way too many metaphysical leaps off of this theory when it offers no justification for doing anything like that. It certainly doesn't provide evidence that our physical universe began to exist and was preceded by nothing. What makes the theory so appealing to apologists is that if you try to object based just on the expansion part, they could bog you down in all sorts of science about how if you try to propose an oscillating model for the universe where it contracts before it expands, or if you go into some kind of like an egg thing where it stays in a state and then eventually expands, they could get into all sorts of different confusing cosmology where we can show that's probably not the case, and they kind of pretend to win by default that, hey, the universe had an absolute beginning. This is invalid. The first sign of that is that the three scientists who came up with the theory 
don't believe in a creator God like William Lane Craig does. This doesn't mean that Craig's wrong, it just means we should be skeptical when he tries to use this theory as evidence that he's right. So where do we go from here? The thing is, is that even if we know that the universe couldn't have always have been expanding, and we have some evidence against an oscillating model or like an egg model for the universe, it doesn't justify saying that the universe was preceded by nothing, and that all of material reality had an absolute beginning by divine fiat. Now, there is a theory that the three scientists from this paper do endorse, and it's similar to what scientists like Lawrence Krauss espouse, which is a theory of quantum nucleation. Effectively, what quantum nucleation means is this. Our four-dimensional space-time didn't always exist. However, the energy that makes it up always has existed, specifically at the quantum level. And it can be shown mathematically that our space-time universe possibly evolved out of a quantum nucleation event that occurred in this energy 13.7 billion years ago. Now there's a whole bunch of other pieces of evidence that actually support the theory, and rather than get into them here, I'm going to link a video by Lawrence Krauss where he gives a lecture on his book, A Universe from Nothing, that describes the evidence. It's actually highly informative, and I very much recommend it. But to get back to the whole Kalam argument, what we need to look at here is that we have a scientific theory about the creation of the universe, and it's not just the quantum nucleation theory. There are other ones, but they pretty much all assume that some form of energy or material reality always existed. Now, this is in contrast to the theistic theory of divine creation out of nothing. And, but you still have to look, even in those theories, they're always assuming that God always existed. So you're coming down to the dichotomy that plagues every cosmological argument. So it looks like we've got two theories again. One assumes God always exists. The other assumes that some form of material reality always existed. How do you pick between the two of them? Well, ultimately, you really don't know. But if you want to compare explanatory power, which is a method that Craig likes to use when he wants to talk about the resurrection of Jesus, you're going to see that the scientific explanation provides both a material and an efficient cause, whereas Craig's theory only provides an efficient cause. Honestly, I'm giving the advantage to the scientists again. Still. Even if you don't agree with giving the advantage to the scientific explanation, the Kalam hasn't established that all of material reality had an absolute beginning preceded by nothing. Remember the burden of proof is on Dr. Craig and other apologists saying that there definitely is a god and this being definitely created material reality out of nothing. I've shown that these assertions aren't supported by the Kalam or by the scientific evidence they try to show along with it. The apologists are left postulating unnecessary entities we're not sure actually even exist to try and explain the origin of the universe. Compare this to the scientific explanation, and there's no question whether quantum energy and the laws of quantum mechanics actually exist or not. And we have good evidence showing that it's at least possible for our four-dimensional space-time universe to come out of only that. What I'm going to get into in the next video is what I like to think of as the nail in the coffin for the Kalam, and that's to show how it rests on some really bad science, and that ultimately becomes a circular argument, because the only reason you have to believe in that bad science is because you already believe in a god.